Good afternoon, Sabina. How you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing good. Excited to have you on the show. You've done quite a few things that are pretty remarkable, and you and I didn't get the chance to meet when we were in sunny Palm Springs at the Entrepreneur of the Year Award, but uh, now we're here, and I'm excited to have you on the show. Um, you know, for, for listeners who don't know your story, maybe would you, would you maybe go back to the day that you decided to become an entrepreneur, and where were you, and how did you decide to jump in with both feet? So we are a creative agency. We specialize in brand experiences around retail, live events, and um, bringing um, either concepts to life or partner with brands to help strategize what their experience map looks like. Um, so back when, I'm, I guess I'm leading into you know why I started the business, there really wasn't a lot of offerings around that category, nine years ago, where now a lot of, in the industry, we have even brands, and now, now everyone's talking about experiences because it's just valued so much. So number one, there was that opportunity to um, really get um, into that category and you know have a niche out there in the market. But when I started the company, I wasn't really thinking of myself actually as an entrepreneur. I was just really thinking of um, clients and their needs and how to service them and really, you know, be that partner. So it really, what I discovered, when I discovered I was an entrepreneur after I started the business where the category itself experience had so much opportunity and, and, and that's how I grew the company in, in, in the fast way because it scaled very quickly from one location to another, to a global company because there was just there was so much um, opportunity around that. So I would say I'd never thought of myself in the previous years of being an entrepreneur, but I really saw that um, there was an opportunity there. And, and now I do call myself an entrepreneur because I'm always thinking of new opportunities to put out there that are niches mm -hmm. and that are needs out there. So, um, but before I was very client centric. So were you know were you working with these clients that you saw the need or you know how did you get to the point where you're thinking about them so much? Well, I've um, been working with clients in this industry in many different aspects for I'm going to date myself here for probably about thirty years <laughs> and twenty five years I wouldn't say thirty years and I've always been fascinated you know with you know how do we do things a little bit different how do we go above beyond in service how do we you know, really um, understand expectations of the client. So I've always, everything I have done in my career has been driven by clients' needs. So it was just a natural, um, when I started the company, was to evolve it around clients' needs. And um, I consider, you know, myself and, and my staff, like we're partners to our clients and we need to, you know, go above beyond and, and really help achieve their goals. We're you know, different, I, we're even career builders for our clients, you know, we're the behind the scenes where we help them, you know, become successful and help them get promoted. A lot of the clients I've worked with nine years ago when I started the business are VPs now, for instance, and oh, cool. I'm not saying it's all a test to what we've done, mm -hmm. but, oh, but you, know, create, you know, making them successful is, is part of it and helping, you know, helping them is helping their brands. So that's really where it, it comes from because if you don't have clients, you don't have a business. <laughs> right. You need, you need the revenue coming in the door to be able to build it. And I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm curious, you know, as you, um, you know, when you said you, you didn't think of yourself as an entrepreneur and then as you slowly realized, what was the evolution of set? I mean, were you, you know, did you have a couple clients as you started out and then you said you scaled pretty significantly. So maybe, you know, a couple of the questions are, what are the milestones that you know you hit as you evolved when you say scale quickly? And then what was the triggering or what was the foresight when you had when you determined that you were an entrepreneur? Did that uh, correlate with the scale or you know, kind of explain the dynamics there? So when um, when you see the opportunity in front of you and when you see that you know you have a niche in the market, it's about going after that opportunity. So for instance. Set started in Portland, Oregon. Um, my first client was Nike, and that's a great client to have. And it's you know in the in the marketing world, that's it's yeah. it's a north star of, it, of its own. And so that was you know really um, a great client to start with because 
it's a great portfolio. You know, people see you already working with premium brand. So the next aspect of the business is how do you grow it? And, and that's in business development and to scale it is to scale with other brands too, to diversify. So the plan after, you know, within, well, I always say within the first year, you know, seeing that there's such an opportunity and a need in the market is that we could take it beyond having beyond Nike. And, and what that meant was that our story could resonate and our portfolio could be used, you know, in, um, to help with that. So our next, step was to to go to a key market in New York so opening up a New York office where you know for what we do we work a lot in retail and that's the epic center of of North America is New York and then we opened up an office in Los Angeles and then we acquired a company in in London to be a global company but the whole thing is when I was really turning into when I was scaling the company I realized I had to step out of one shoe into another where where I was explaining how client centric I was. So I was really working in my business and but in order for it to scale, I really had to step out of being in the weeds and the details of things and start hiring people, start bringing in a team that can take on the things that I wasn't um, an expert on. So when it came to things like operations, um, structure of the business. And then as we we're adding offerings, um, I needed to bring in experts of these other offerings too, because our clients wanted to come to a one-stop shop basically, but you know, you can't pretend to do it all. You need to bring in the right talent to help you get there. So I stepped out of a lot of that and started building a team, a leadership team. And that's part of scaling the business is bringing in the right talent, and I and I call it bringing in smarter people, smarter than me, um, to right. help me to say to scale the company. And that's what I would say. My that's when I turned the corner of when I was really working in the business versus on the business. And when I started working on the business, it just became different for me, where I became more of an advisor and manager and more of, you know, more of the big picture person and, um, and then had people, you know, come in for specific roles. Um, and then, and then you were, then I was able to scale the company. No, I think, I think you hit on a bunch of really good points, Sabina, because I think that that is something that everybody wants to do, but they find themselves stuck in being able to do that, whether it's, the you know being able to take the money right out of the profits that are going to them to hire these you know the next level management or even you know trying to figure out what's the right approach and who's the right people you know maybe take us through a little bit of that journey what, what you know how did you determine who to hire how did you you know recruit them what what was some of the things and first of all what you know what pushed you to hire these people instead of just you know being stuck and working on you know in the business well um, fortunately. I, the question you're the question you're asking is definitely a challenge for many many people and, and many other entrepreneurs that I um, network with too, and I'm I'm asked this, this question quite a bit. So I was lucky in one sense that um, I married a great guy, <laughs> Nick Perkovich, <laughs> who came onto my business. So I um, I started my business before I got married, and um, but I guess it's it's not to make this conversation about my husband, but it's more about a trusted partner. I think when you, you got to find that right trusted partner. And I think that's, um, that can help you that you can trust with your finances that understands your organization that actually treats the organization as if they're the owner of it mm -hmm. too. And, um, you know, people, the people aspect is the toughest part about business because you, you know, you want to entrust people, but then, you know, or decisions are made and then you have to reset, you know, that <laughs> yeah. and so having, I call it in the executive level um, of your leadership team, because there, as you scale, you have different tiers of leadership too. you know, the executive level, you have to have that triangle of trust. And so finding that right person that you entrust that can make the decisions as you can, you know, as an owner um, of the business is key. So I had that. I had the trusted partner, which happens to be my husband. And it's about onboarding the right people. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's down to. So 
then finding that right next person that can own, you know, a capability that we have. And, um, and, and when they're not right, you got to let them go and you got to hide, you just got to keep finding the right person. It's hard, you know, isn't it? Partner, It really is. And, and I think that's a common problem with most businesses and, you know, you, you got to find it's, it's the business of, it's the marriage business, I call it, where, you know, you got to make, you have to make sure that the people that surround you in the leadership aspect have the same goals, that they understand your goals, they understand, you know, your vision, where you need to go and what they're, what they're accountable for. And, you know, you bring people in, if you just make that one or two investment into, into these people that usually cost more money, then you need, you, you should know you need to get a lot out of them and that they need to be accountable for, for, you know, where they, within the yep. year or two where the business needs to go. So was there anything that you did to be, you know, so, I mean, the very unique that you worked with your husband and I, I've been in and out of family businesses and there's lots of dynamics there. <laughs> and, <Yep. laughs> you know, you know, so I, I think, would you mind, you know, peeling that back and, you know, what was your skill set and what was your husband's and then how did you guys actually work and who, well, whose role was what within the organization? And then even explain the, 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 the next level deeper of, you know, what were the different roles and responsibilities and then how did you determine what those would be? And it, was there any unique things that you did to align their compensation or their motives or their goals to you and your husband's and the company's goals? Because I think getting all of that stuff in line, um, there's a lot of unique ways to do it, but I think it's a big challenge. I don't know if you want to, if there's anything interesting that you did to make that all happen. Well, the way everything evolved, so in in my company, we have an executive leadership and and it's comprised of three people and that's my husband Kurt myself and the CEO Alistair and so in my role I come from the industry I know the business really well um, and I know the experience side of the business more on how to take a design concept to um, and make and bringing it to life so that's where a lot of my expertise comes from and that's how set started um, what Kurt brought um, his expertise is operations where he brought in a structure and an org chart, you know, things that yeah. I, I, I'm not an expert in. And he brought in project management systems. You know, he comes from the technology world, in other words, but at the same time, he also wears a business development hat. He's got kind of that dual brain yeah. going on. <laughs> where he was thinking, okay, we need to scale. We need to grow. We need, you know, we need to do marketing. We need, and so forth. So he was driving a lot of the, the business development and then then also the operations and finance of the business. So um, so there was that. So operations also, you know, inclu is inclusive of, OK, you know, we need to find a space in New York, you know, negotiations. And that part is so critical to making sure you get the right deals. And, and then you also have the right advisors, such as the right lawyers, the right accountants and so forth. So he's, he was very instrumental to, you know, that part of the business. So I could focus on the clients and, and the other part. Mm -hmm. So that was very helpful. And then as we were going into next levels, hired, um, Alistair Lloyd Jones, who comes from the, the traditional world of advertising. And I would say the the world of strategy, but he really knew the experience circle too, and saw the future that brands are going to need, you know, more of where traditional advertising lives than than in, in media and spending money in um, TV commercials. That that industry is going to shift where brands really need to engage consumers around different experiences rather than TV commercials because now we have so many different mm -hmm. sort of touch points. And so Al Alistair brings that expertise to the table you know, where he's worked with many CMOs and VPs of marketing, um, because, you know, that is a different, that's a different audience. Um, so we, so we brought in somebody who can, you know, be quite futuristic and help set a tone for our message and help keep us ahead of the game, basically. Yeah, I think that's an awesome team that that you had, and I'm 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 curious because because your husband and I don't I mean you guys owned the company technically to probably together or you owned it and he 
treated it like his own because <laughs> indirectly he was benefiting from it. Um, so there was an, you know, maybe, I don't know if there's anything that you did there on how you guys worked out your agreement, but like, I think the reason I'm asking these questions is because a lot of people know that they need to hire a CEO or there's a, there's a book out there called traction that talks about this visionary versus integrator. And there's this GM or however you want to label that CEO. And uh -huh. how do you align them to make them feel like it's your, their company as well, whether it's phantom stock options or slight, you know, equity or certain things. Did you, is there anything that you did to align his incentive program to the entire company's goals? Yeah, so my husband and I, we both own the company now together. In the beginning, he he wasn't, um, but but now, you know, we have a different, you know, we are now both shareholders in the mm -hmm. company. Um, and as far as, like, key talent, as far as, um, you know, when it, especially when it came to leadership, um, we did work through a unit ownership plan where our key leaders, we want them to, you know, feel like they're invested in, or invested into the company. And that, you know, the, the, as it's, as, as we hit our goals, our revenue goals, our succession, you know, we wanted it to also be shared too with the key, with the key players. Mm -hmm. So we did that and, and, you know, coming into the selling of the company, we had to really make a lot of decisions about, you know, who that is. And, and we wanted also our team, you know, I'll keep key players to be part of it because we wanted to keep them too. So we did come up with a unit ownership plan. Well, that's interesting. And I want to, I want to peel that back too when we kind of move into the transition, because I think you know, getting the, the key leaders involved in the exit is extremely important. It sounds like you guys did some unique things there. And so as we, as we kind of migrate that way in the story, you know, with you, your, your husband and your CEO, especially the CEO being futuristic, what was, the, I mean, did you guys start with the end in mind or was it grow, grow, grow? And then all of a sudden there was a triggering event, you know, where in, what was the foresight and what actually was the triggering event to lead to the eventual acquisition? So it was different, many different things. Um, but I would say the key aspect is that we were, we were just in the right time. And I think that's how a lot, I think acquisitions is about timing. You know, when I, when I look in hindsight, where we had a unique offering in the industry that a lot of we came from the experience where we we were the we were truly an experienced agency and we came from that and there wasn't a lot of experienced agencies that doing what we did and so that became a tr so we were the trend and we felt like this is the right time because two years or three years later there's going to be a lot of agencies like us and sure enough they're you know, we have a lot more competition now than we used to. So that was one thing that we felt that that was um, that was going to be important. Um, so what we did was we reached out to an M and A advisor that in our industry just to just understand, you know, is this the right time or not? And we found out that it absolutely is. And that same advisor also knew the larger holding company. So there was a couple of decisions we could take. Either we go the equity route or we go um, more of the strategic partner route. And um, so that led to, you know, wh what is this all about? And where did, why did we go to with the strategic partner? Because we went with the WPP. Because I was looking for growth. And um, SET has always been a cash run company. And in order to grow, you know, you need the right partner. And two, we wanted to move more into the above the line communications of brands and WPP being the largest holding company in the world owns a lot of great relationships with, um, you know, Sir Martin Sorrell, you know, he's very much engaged with, you know, who he's, who he works with and has been a great advocate for us. So, you know, for me, it was about the right culture fit. It was about going into the future. It was about having that right partner to take us there. The same time, it was the right time to sell because WPP actually never had an experienced agency, so we were a unique proposition within that whole entire holding company that was massive, and we saw an opportunity within them too. So those were those were the decisions. Where okay, th there's only so far we could take ourselves being a cash run company, but then if we want to keep scaling and and keep going further what is the best option and and in the timing of things it felt that you know and and going through the whole interview process with WPP it felt 
it was the right partnership to take us there. Well, and I, I think it's an awesome story. And, it, and if we can take a couple of those things in chunks, because, you know, one of the things you know, that I think a lot of entrepreneurs, they have this vision of their baby that they've grown and they've got this vision for the company. You know, as you went through this journey, did your vision change of what you wanted with the ultimate you know, goal? Did, what, how did the vision of what you wanted this business to be? Did it, did it evolve? Did it change? Did it change as you were having these conversations? Because I think, it, you know, when you realize that the opportunities are different based on the every different kind of potential acquirer it brings different things to the table. You know, did what did it line up with your vision that you already had or did your vision change? So we're fortunate that we have a lot of control over what our vision still is. So WPP doesn't really get too involved in our business. Um, they let us um, run you know, um, and continue building our goals as quite the independent within the organization. Um, but just to answer the question in a different way, um, I never thought the business was going, you know, when I started said, I never thought it was going to turn into what it is now. So there was a lot of adjustment. And then also you, you know, each year you have um, as you see the opportunities in the market, your vision changes. So you have to, I think, reset and reset with the times and, and you know, how brands are changing and, you know, you, you have to just keep resetting. But we, we do that at set, you know, WPP, we ask for advisors when needed, but we still do that as, um, as yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Quite independently. Um, but we can also, um, but they help us too. You know, the, the big reason was that we wanted more access to, you know, a bigger market and, you know, and, and, and it takes time, you know, it didn't happen overnight when we we're three years into it right now, but we've, you know, you have to network, you have to, you know, you, you do all the same things, but you just have a, a, a different style and different way of doing it. But it's, it's definitely you know, in hindsight, it's been a great decision and it's um, being part of a, a larger network, a larger team. And That's awesome to have. A, that sounds like you've got a good partnership. And I know there's a lot of stories where someone sells it and they, they lose the control and the vision changes and all of a sudden they're, they're, they're not able to make the decisions that they wish they would have. And if we were to go back and you know, when you and your husband and your CEO were saying, okay, there might be time you reached out to the M&A advisor, what was it that like, was it a conversation around dinner or at the office where you wanted to hit a goal or something like what actually like gave you the push to call the M&A advisor? Well, um, really from um, the, you know, when you have a business that's, that's scaling so quickly, you know, we, we were in our prime time and the question I think every business owner needs to think about is, you know, their exit plan. And um, Kurt, uh, my husband, coming from that world was, you know, we need to, we need to start drafting that exit plan. And so that's when it came up um, because the business again was doing really well. And that's when you want to start thinking about things like that. And so then you start exploring the options and and finding the right advisors on what that looks like. And it just happened that when we just reached out about that um we found out that we were actually a hot ticket so mm -hmm. this is a great opportunity to to um and great timing to actually do this because because if we wait one year or two years from now it may not be the right timing mm -hmm. or well, it's, I think yeah. it, it's interesting that you guys did that because so I think the thing that I run across and so you know when we were at you know at EY's deal it, I the, the, the common trend that I hear is that, you know, working on your exit plan, I'm not going to sell now or ever. I don't plan on it. And that, there's this kind of like this, you know, voodoo around even thinking about it. They feel like they're, you know, people are like, you know, cheating or being, right. <laughs> you know, being deceiving, you know. What do you? What kind of advice do you have to people about that that think that way? Because I think you guys did the right thing, obviously, and people don't want to sell when they're on top because it's growing and there's always another uh, another year. How how did you? How did you know? What, how do you get over that? Do you have any idea? Well, I think the, one of the biggest one of the biggest things that people fear is that when you sell the company, you lose your baby. Basically, mm -hmm. you, you lose control. You lose, you know, any right. But my advice back is that, you know, not all contracts are made the same and you can actually write, 
you can actually um, write your contract where, you know, you can still be part of the business when you sell the business. You know, there's just different things that you can do. Now, it all depends on everybody's goals, you know, what their personal goals are, of course. You know, maybe some people do want to sell and they don't want to be part of the business, you know. So, but I think there's that perception is when you sell the business, that's it. You know, mm-hmm. we're, you know, you, you have a brand new boss and you don't have any say so. And the company, you know, and you, and you actually do hear nightmare stories around that. And I've met um, some that have that. But what I say is that you can actually challenge and negotiate the contracts differently. And, and, you know, when we, when we were negotiating with WPP, I had a great negotiator, which was Kurt, but for me, my part where I wanted to make sure to protect the culture of set, because we have a certain way that we deliver and how we engage with clients. And that actually, um, you know, and I can't get any, any details about contract, but I had to, to, um, I had to, um, actually call those out, you know, to, and, and it was all in negotiation. And so what I tell people is that, you know, I'm sure you hear those stories and that's why you just have to be, you have to understand all your options and you have to have the right advisors too. So you can go with an equity partner who's not going to help you grow your business. For instance, they're going to be just all about numbers mostly, or you could go with a strategic partner that can, you know, well, it's still about, you know, financial reports, of course, but also, you know, there could be other partnerships you can have with a strategic, if you sell to a strategic partner, but also get the right lawyers, get the right accountants, you know, that, that can deliver, you know, all types of options and um, on how you negotiate, you know, the selling of your company. If you don't actually invest into that, then you're probably going to make some decisions you regret. <laughs> Bingo. I, I totally agree. And I'm curious because you sound, I mean, be, you, so wise about how you went into this with eyes wide open. I, one of the biggest challenges I, I've seen people have is that they don't know what questions to ask. <laughs> so like you were asking the right questions and knowing how the difference between equity and a strategic partner and how they're going to manage it and how they're going to deal with the culture. You know, where were you getting these, it, it, you know, the insights and to ask those questions on how all of that's going to affect? Because if you don't ask the right questions and you don't know the answers, you can't even draft them in the negotiation in the contracts, right? So you have to understand all those different things. What, were there resources or how did you, how did you get the ability to ask and have those insights? Maybe people are just afraid to ask. Like I, I just know what's important um, for the business, you know, being a business owner and what makes it successful. And I understand if when you sell your company, you're selling it to another way of doing things, a different type of culture. And so you know, I think it's important that, you know, people know that, you know, you are going to be dealing with different people. You are going to have a different boss. And, but it's clear that, you know, what makes your company successful is that, you know, how you all currently operate it. And, you know, do you want to immediately change that? And if you do, you're going to affect your business, you know, in different ways. And so, you know, those were important questions on my end. Now there's a whole nother financial side of, <laughs> you know, that you have to think of that, that um, you need the right advisors for. And I wouldn't even know where to start asking those questions unless I had the, the right, you know, attorneys there by your side, helping you get there. And, and you leave it to the experts, you know, to guide you through, you know, to making the best financial deal as possible. And, and so I would, I would say that, you know, don't be afraid of, you know, asking for what you want. And I think that's what happens. People don't, people don't, you know, they just think it's, you know, um, status quo, but you can actually negotiate a lot of different things in contracts. Well, I think you hit on a bunch of amazing pieces there. And so, you know, when you think about because you knew what you wanted for you and the business and the culture and your legacy and what you wanted to continue doing. And then you've got all the technical stuff, right? And it's like two sides of the same coin, because some of the things that you might want have a ripple effect more into like the contracts or the financial dollar amount or whatever it might be. You know, what did you have the ability to say, okay, let's say I want to make sure I have the culture or whatever this might be. How did that impact the financial outcome? So maybe even before you answer that, Sabina, 
without having to disclose any of the actual dollar amounts, but how did you value the business? And once you had that benchmark, how did these things that you were asking for swing the outcomes? So if that makes sense, maybe two parts to that question. When, how did you value the business? And then how did you understand the things that you were requesting impact that dollar amount? Well, I think, you know, just to kind of answer the question in a different, maybe a different way, mm -hmm. um, in hindsight, looking back, and, and, and if it's advice about selling the business, if you, if you want to leverage a negotiation, you have to have leverage points. So if your business is doing really well and you have a niche in the market, um, whether it's a service business or a product business, and you have, you know, you have a, a nice margin in the business and you have a great client list and you have, you know, an audience, you know, whatever that your business is, then you're just going to have a better negotiation leverage for negotiation. And, and so that's why I think it's important when to actually put your, your business in the market to sell your business when you're at top. And so I think that's that way you have a better negotiation angle with whether it's equity firm or a strategic partner. And that's what it was for us. Like we, we were actually winning really new, exciting business. We had a great client list. We had, you know, we, we ran our business really well. It had um, a nice margin to it. And, and, um, and, you know, we, um, so we were able to walk away if you need to. Exactly, because we actually had a bidding war on us. And and so when people say, you know, hey, I don't want to sell my business, it's doing really well, that's actually when you should. <laughs> <laughs> because trends happen in the market. You know, you got to think, you know, two, three years from now, your business may not be the same. Business goes up and down. It's it's never it's never stays high. You know, you always have to make adjustments. And so, you know, I hope I'm answering your question, but, you know, we were able to negotiate probably more of a bit of the control aspect of it because we were, you know, we had a, a good business. Right. And I think you, you nailed it when it's, it, it's the, the ability to walk away because you can keep running it and keep making money and because other people will buy it. So you'll be able to actually get what you want on the contracts. Right. Right. So right. going back to the other part of my question, which is, I'm just curious on when you, you know, there's a lot of different types to value ways to value a company. And, you know, there's the, when you got a strategic partner, there's the return on investment that they're going to make being able to cross sell. Um, so how, however that dollar amount in the strategic sale, then there's like multiples of EBITDA or discounted cash flow or whatever it might be. Is there a certain methodology that you used in your specific sale? And then were there other methodologies that were being used with these other buyers? Well, um, it's good, to, again, going back to um, getting the right advisors, because the first things first is you need to understand the value of your business and how you get there. So in particular, set is a service business. So there's a certain multiplier that goes around, you know, what a service business is versus maybe a product business is probably a higher multiplier and and understand that, you know, you need to, you know, audit your own, you know, get your book straight, basically audit, you know, get an auditor in to get yourself ready because that's going to happen anyways when you, <laughs> you know, you're going to go through a due diligence process. So, you know, you need to be, you, you need to understand your value. And, um, and so for us, it's, um, we went with a strategic partner because, because, um, they understand what relationships mean. So what clients mean and the potential of growth you can have with, you know, your company versus a, um, an equity firm is just looking at numbers. They're not valuing, you know, in, in my, what we experienced, like they, they weren't valuing where we could be in, in three, four, five years from now, if that makes sense. They were just, you know, looking at, okay, you know, numbers. And so, <laughs> yeah. um, and so that could actually bring the value lower, if that makes sense. And um, so it's also about where, you know, you can take your business in the future that helps you value your company. And um, so anyway, so again, you know, knowing, knowing what your value is and bringing in those right partners, like the M&A and negotiating the right outcome of percentage with that and, you know, some people use lawyers, you know, to help them with that. You know, it's, it's, it all, it all depends. I hear many different things. I think that's but, not, I think that's awesome because, um, I like how you're explaining it because I, 
a strategic what i've seen and that, that we sold to a strategic uh partner as well and they get you and you're able to almost like sell your it's like one big sale right so instead of just looking at the numbers and having it being very dry and number based and not opportunistic it, you're actually looking at all the potential synergies and the upside so you're able to hopefully drive the value up too and the the future relationship right exactly because they understand your industry and that's key so as you're going through this what role did you want to play in the business afterwards and how did you I mean you've mentioned that you fact that you've got you know you stressed the control was it you know how did that whole structure work I mean because it's a holding company that kept you autonomous was there certain things that you did in the contracts or in the equity structure to be able to make sure that you were able to have the the part that you still do well there's always the next phase so um, one thing when we sold the company I still remain CEO of the company um, for for about two and a half years. I've recently stepped out. I'm now chairman. I call myself a chairperson. Yeah. <laughs> um, chairperson founder is my new title. Um, but it was always the intention when we brought Alistair in is to groom in, into this role. Um, he was one of the, you know, when you, when you sell the package, it's in services about selling the people too. And it's important that you know, that when WPP bought us for three reasons, it was the three of us. So it was Alistair, Kurt, and I, and, and knowing that, you know, they're, they're, they're um, acquiring talent. So I did remain the CEO. Um, and then um, Alistair was groomed to, to become CEO, which is now, and my, my role has changed. I'm more of then an advisor now and I work closely with Alistair, but then we also also have certain other lines of businesses and I call them offerings really within mm -hmm. set. And you know, I, I'm still engaged with key clients and um helping the lines of businesses, the offerings, and um we just launch an advisory board, you know, there's and so there is still a lot to do and and um but we're all working you know towards still the future and and mm -hmm. and you know our business is ever changing so so it's it's key that you know that we're all still work as that triangle i call it the kurt allister and sabina triangle and move it into the future it's just things have changed you know so kurt has stepped out of operations role too and he focuses also on um lines of the offerings which are you know are growing and becoming its own type of growth in the business mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um still in business development and alistair is now you know he's in charge of operations he's in charge of you know, um, the managing directors of the locations and um also business growth you know so so it's been a transition but um, I don't believe it was any surprise to anybody because we've been, you know, working on this for a while within WPP and and our in our yep. company. So when you know, because you had said that, you know, the in the services industry that it's acquiring people and it's acquiring the talent and you guys as the management team. One, uh, when you look at how that whole structure works, you, I'm just kind of curious on like when they actually the, the deal structure and then also making sure that, that they kept you was, uh, you know, was the deal structure for like, was it cash up front? Was it kind of tied to earn out or promissory notes? I'm curious on how that worked to, to make sure that you guys stayed because obviously that's a big need for them. And then how did they align that with everybody else going forward? I mean, is, was there, way to keep everybody um so i don't know if there was a and then how did how did that affect your number so did you go in actually knowing the number that you needed personally with you and your husband and layer that into kind of the deal structure and then how to you know align that with you staying yeah it does so um i think when um so we so in service industry it's very common to do an earn out because you need the people to you know the key people to stay in and um so that's that's a very standard so we're we have the this, this standard i would say contract when it comes to that now um there is cash up front and one thing one thing um so you initially buy the business and, and all ne all negotiations are different because we had um also different we had different um holding companies that actually were interested in us and they all come in different ways but in particular there was an actual down 
a cash down and then then there's an earn out as well too so um so that's the structure we're in and that helped you know incentivize people to stay now not everybody stays that's one thing you learn it's you know i think the um but but all i'll keep people um have stayed how, you know, did, how did you tell your employees? I, I'm curious, like, in how many did you have at the time? And so what was kind of the, the overall, like, infrastructure size? And then how did you tell everybody? Well, you what you want to do is you want to hold off telling until the deal is <laughs> quite done. But, you know, this is a small world and people find out otherwise because they see, you know, people coming in and out of your office and they make sense of it. But, you know, you, you do need to tell the key people and, um, you know, what your intentions are of selling the business and, and why you're doing what you're doing. And, you know, in all truth, it's not always going to resonate with everyone. And so um, one of my big surprises was how many people did actually end up leaving because they were either scared or just thought, oh, you know, she's selling the business and, and that's it. You know, now she's going to buy a home wherever in Hawaii. and and be done with it but it really wasn't the intention so and you are going to be i think people will be affected by it you know your employees and you're going to have a certain turnover that was when i spoke to others that that um has sold a business you know it just it's i think it's part of that did that affect you at all well i mean it is in, in an emotional sense yes you know yeah, that's I, what I mean yeah it, you know that that happened because you know I knew what my intentions were, but you know it's that's business for you sometimes. You know it just doesn't always go the way you want it to go. And um, but um, I had like the hardest time telling my employees because we had about ninety, and it was just like really tough. <laughs> and then everybody like treats you differently, like you said, and and emotionally, it's it's a tough deal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was sad to see some good people go, and and it did turn into um, other things. That, you know, I didn't, I didn't anticipate, and that was that's one of the advice I give to people. You know, anticipate that you will have turnover, that you will go through this, and you're going to probably have to rebuild part of your team, and we had to do that too. But in hindsight, sometimes that's a good thing too, where. You know, you can reset your company, you know, to the new, you know, to your new vision when you, when you do sell. So, you know, there's, there's multiple ways of looking at it when you look back. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I was, you know, close to a lot of my employees because um, a lot of them were with me since day one. And then, you know, when we sold the company, it was, it was sad to see some of them go. But um, but everybody's well now, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How many employees did you have when you guys sold? Um, we had about a hundred, about a hundred and twenty-five people. I'm r roughly a hundred people. I, I actually don't know exact numbers, but I think roughly a hundred people. So you know, as you're have been shifting more towards the founder and the chairperson, you know. What's on the on the agenda for you right now and in the future? I mean, I I think some of the people that go through this they have a challenge of kind of reinventing themselves or keeping the the, the fire burning within. Is there some things that you're doing to keep your eye on a future target or future passions or hobbies or within the business? You know, it's funny how you mentioned reinventing yourself. You know, when you are when you don't mean to be an entrepreneur and then you. Then, then you start a business and you it scales so fast. I feel like I've reinvented myself every year, and this is <laughs> another year for that. <laughs> and uh, because you, when you go into different levels, you know you have the different responsibilities, and and so so yes, I am there of reinventing myself because I'm stepping out of a role that I've been in for you know almost nine years, and um, and now I see my role as as something of an advisor and. And then also um, getting myself out more, um, being a cultural leader for my company, and really helping um, my team in more in the big picture of you know where it's going in the future, bringing in helping bring in the right talent, and then also being in contact with key clients to and listening to these two our key clients and making you know each day better for us you know from feedback and so. Um, bringing in an advisory board, which we've actually never had before, you know, building that and, you know, making us 
better. And and I I just see this role right now, and it's going to evolve. It's just me really working closely with the leadership. I would say more with the CEO anything and and really help him become successful in the company. I love it. So as you look back at this journey over the last nine years and specifically the last, you know, three or four, is there anything throughout the exit or the pre or post that you would have, you know, done a little bit differently now that you look back? Um, I, you know, I look at for, I think one thing I didn't expect was how distracting the the whole process was for selling the company how much it takes you out of the business Mm -hmm. and in hindsight i just wonder if you know if i knew how much you know i need to travel and and um you know you you know when you have multiple bitter you know there's just there's a lot to that process and you have to keep it as quiet as possible and, <laughs> and um, you know, God, you know, there, and it's, it's emotional too, because, you know, it's your baby, you know, and you, you want to make sure you're making the right decisions. Um, so I didn't realize how much of a distraction it was. So I would say in hindsight, if I had somebody tell me how much it was, I would have probably approached it a little bit different. In what way? Um, I would have paid more attention to the business and the people in the business because I was quite engaged with the business um, at a certain level, you know, it, maybe people would have felt more secure about it rather than, you know, not seeing me as much or, mm-hmm. or it's a challenge, it. isn't it? It is a challenge. So I would say that that would be probably my, my, my advice to people who are, you know, just be prepared that, you're going to not be focusing on your business and it will affect your business. Well, and, right, well, exactly. And I think, you know, there's, it's keeping the eye on the ball of the business, but also on that, it's a foot in each bucket and you, it's a, it stretches you thin. And I think the one thing, and I don't know if you experienced this with the different bidders or, you know, at all during the journey, but is it's difficult to say that you want to, it's difficult to pull away because there's so much momentum. They call it the deal momentum because you're so distracted that you just want to get it done with. So did you experience that at all in the process or was it just just overall taxing yeah no i i think the um what you were saying yeah i did experience that in the process where it's like okay let's just move on <laughs> <laughs> let's get this done and go to the next chapter um but it it took a while you know i i think um our deal just took a lot longer because we were the, we were stuck in a lot of negotiations because it was probably not a simple deal um because there was things that, you know, we, like I was mentioning, I really wanted to protect the culture of the company. You know, there was a lot of rewriting of, of, a, um, of the deal. So, so it just took longer. It, it kind of dragged on. Um, so I was happy when it was done and, and, and we, we came to a good agreement between both companies and we moved on. So, did your advisors help you along that way? Because I think one of the biggest challenges that people have is making sure that the other, the buyer doesn't see the fatigue because then there's, that could affect the price. So did they help manage that, you know, that roller coaster? They did. They did. And Kurt too, he was a lot of, and part of that, but yes, the, the lawyer, we had really good lawyers that helped us through that process of, you know, the back. Forth. And I think that that was honestly really key. That's why you hire them. Mm-hmm. They should yes. provide their return and investment, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So Sabine, as you, you know, we talked about a bunch of stuff. Is there anything that you want to highlight of something that we said, or maybe something that we didn't, that you want to leave our listeners with? Oh my goodness. That's a big question. <laughs> um, let me think here for a moment. Um, you know, I, I think when it, when it just comes to selling the business, just really know why you want to do it. I mean, just because you want to craft the the um, the deal that way. So just know your intentions. If it's something that you, you know, if you want to continue in the business and grow in the business, just know that you know you can you can actually negotiate that and and also. Um, but if you just want out, you know, you can definitely you know craft mm-hmm. it, craft that as well. And I think that you just you just kind of, you just got to know what you want too and i think that's that's key i i think you literally nailed it because there's a book out there called finish big by bo burlingham i don't know if you've heard of that before but it's like 
the best way to exit and have, and be happy is to know what you want and why. <laughs> and that's literally what he, like how he, he boils it all down. Yes. So if there's a, a, a way for our listeners to get in touch with you, what's the best way? So the, um, I have an email address. Um, it's steschler at setcreative.com. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Sabina, for coming on the show. I really appreciated it. Well, thank you. Thanks for your time.